it today. Lesson 20. It's time now to look at another major scale, the scale of A major. At the top of page 229 of your booklet, you can see how this new scale is put together. As always, there has to be the proper sequence of tones and semitones. The same as in the C major scale. To get it right for A major, we have to add a C sharp, an F sharp, and a G sharp. That gives us a whole tone between A and B, another tone from B to C sharp, a semitone, C sharp to D, three more tones between D and E, E and F sharp, and F sharp and G sharp, and finally a semitone from G sharp to A. So A major has a key signature of F sharp, C sharp, and G sharp. The sharps are always given in that order in the key signature, by the way. Remember that D major has a key signature of F sharp and C sharp, so for A major we've just added another sharp on the end, G sharp. Exercise 223 will give you a chance to play the A major scale. It's also excellent practice at the thumb under technique. Between C sharp and the D in the right hand, and between E and F sharp in the left. Exercise 223. If you turn to page 230 of your booklet, you'll find a section on triplets. Triplets are basically groups of three notes fitted into the time normally taken up by two. This is why they're called an irregular grouping of notes, because they don't fit into the usual time scheme. As you're aware, in simple time, each crotchet beat is subdivided into two quavers, so you count one and two and, and so on. But triplets have to be counted like compound time, in threes. One, two, three, one, two, three. Since they have to fit into the same length of beat as the normal two quavers, the triplets are played faster than a simple quaver. So if we were to count a bar of quavers followed by a bar of triplets, it would go something like this. One and two, and one, two, three, one, two, three. This may sound a bit complicated, but it's really simple enough in practice. Let's run through the seven examples on pages 230 and 231. We'll play each example twice, and you should do the same after you've listened to the tape. Here's example A. You can see, by the way, that the triplets are marked by a figure three and a short curved line written beneath each group of notes. Example A. Example B. Example C combines normal quavers with triplets. We've written example D in two different ways. The effect is identical in the two cases. The tied notes in the triplets in the top version are the same as the crotchet in the triplets below. When the triplet is written as a crotchet and a quaver, a sort of bracket appears above the notes with the figure three standing for triplet in the middle. The bracket makes it clear where the triplet begins and ends, which otherwise might be difficult to see. Here's example D.
The example E again is written twice. Both versions are in fact exactly the same. Now example F, with a normal quaver tied to the first of the triplets. Finally, example G. The tied notes here set up quite a complex rhythm. Exercise 224 is for the right hand. Watch out for the three sharps in the A major key signature. Our solo piece for this lesson is Mozart's Minuet in F. It's not an especially difficult piece, but it has got triplets, pause signs, and a rallentando, a slowing down, at the end. In the first two bars of the second to last line, and in the first two bars of the last line as well, the left hand is in two parts. One is a dotted minim, and the other a crotchet rest followed by a minim. Make sure you hold the dotted minim right through the bar. Another thing to notice is how the first eight bars, marked to be played mezzo forte or quite loud, are immediately repeated in the next eight bars with exactly the same notes, but this time piano, softly. And pay careful attention to the contrast between staccato and legato throughout the piece. It's essential to the feel of this rather stately 18th century dance. Whatever you do, don't forget the key signature, B-flat. So let's hear Mozart's Minuet in F. Exercise 225 is in D major, with a key signature of F-sharp and C-sharp. Of course, the main point of this exercise is the use of triplets alongside ordinary quavers. But it's interesting to take a look at how the whole piece is put together. The first four bars are played mezzo forte, and then the same four bars are repeated again piano. Next, the key signature changes to B-flat so the music moves into F major. This lasts for four bars, with the left hand playing the triplets and quavers instead of the right. Then the music goes back into D major with the return of the F and C sharp key signature. The last four bars have the same notes as the first four, but with a gentle decrescendo to pianissimo, very soft at the end. Here's exercise 225.
Our second new scale for this lesson is the E-flat major scale. You'll find it on page 236 of your booklet. This time we need to add an A-flat and a B-flat to get the sequence of tones and semitones that we need. So the E-flat major scale has a key signature of three flats, B-flat, E-flat and A-flat. Exercise 226 will let you practice playing the new scale. As usual, watch the fingering very carefully indeed. You'll notice that since the first note of the scale, the tonic, is a black key, it isn't played with the thumb. You start with the third finger in the left hand and the second finger in the right. Exercise 226. Handel's Passacaglia is a famous piece of classical music that we've taken as the basis of an arrangement of our own disco handle. Let's listen to them both, one after the other. First the Passacaglia as a keyboard solo, and then disco handle for keyboard and orchestra.
You'll have noticed that each eight bar section between the repeat marks is played twice, both in the passacaglia and in disco handle. The passacaglia shouldn't pose any special problems, as long as you remember the B and E flat key signature. At the start of the disco handle piece, the key signature changes to F sharp, but it goes back to two flats halfway through. This chopping and changing of key signatures may seem a little confusing at present, but don't worry, everything gets easier with practice, and you'll soon find you're almost instinctively remembering the key signature at any given moment in time. It's worth mentioning, by the way, that both the passacaglia and disco handle are written in minor keys, not the major keys you've already met. So the sections with the B-flat, E-flat key signature are not in the key of B-flat to major, but G minor, and the F-sharp key signature indicates E minor, not G major. It's some time before we'll get round to studying minor scales, so for the moment just take it in your stride. The figure 8 at the start of Disco Handle means that the orchestra has an 8-bar introduction before the keyboard comes in. In fact, you've met this situation before. At first, you'll have to count carefully through the introduction so that you come in at the right moment. But when you've done this a few times, you'll probably find you've just recognised the point where you have to start playing. The most striking feature of Disco Handle is the rhythm. Look at the first two bars of the keyboard part. The last quaver of the first bar is tied to the semibrieve which fills the second bar. The effect of this is that the note is played not on the first beat of the second bar, but a quaver before the beat. It's this way of playing notes just before the beat that gives the piece its special rhythm. It happens again and again through the music. Try playing the piece slowly, counting all the time, before you attempt to put it together with the backing. And watch out especially for the left-hand part in the last eight bars. This is marked to be played an octave above the written notes. So the first note in the left hand in the last eight bar section is the D above middle C, not the D below middle C as it's written. The next note is the G above middle C, and so on. You may need to play this left hand part through a few times before you can read the notes accurately as an octave higher. So now here is disco handle with the orchestra only.
exercise 227 carries on the rhythm practice from previous lessons. Here we're moving on to compound time. Once more, there's no need of a keyboard, just tap along with the metronome. And, as in the last lesson, you'll find that some of the examples are identical, although written differently. Let's try a few of them. Number 49. Number 57. Now, 59. Number 61. And finally, number 62. So, now we'll leave the metronome beat on, and it's over to you. If the metronome stops before you get right through the exercise, just rewind and start again.